بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the entirely merciful the especially merciful يؤتي الحكمة من يشاء ومن يؤتى الحكمة فقد أوتي خيرا كثيرا وما يذكر إلا أولو الألباب He gives wisdom to whom he wills and whoever has been given wisdom has certainly been given much good and none will remember except those of understanding صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كاس واز اسٹابلشڈ ان 2019 تو فل ان دی نالج اینڈ ریسرچ گیپس دیٹ ایگزسٹڈ ان دی ڈومینز اف ایروسپیس اینڈ نیشنل سیکورٹی ان ان ادر وائز تھنک ٹینک رچ کیپٹل اسلام آباد to achieve our objective of being amongst the best think tanks of the region and with focused mission cas has made significant contributions by providing policy guidelines on important issues of national interest especially security both in military and non military domains disseminated through direct as well as indirect engagement on regular basis As part of the advisory board of the Government of Pakistan's National Security Division, CAS has and would continue to serve as a thought leader by providing independent, innovative, evidence-based solutions to strengthen Pakistan's national security, including specific emerging geostrategic and geoeconomic situations. Maintaining a winning aerospace power requires high end technologies that are not only cost intensive but their availability with the passage of time is likely to be challenging in our region these technologies are largely acquired therefore working towards our vision of strengthening national security in all its domains through indigenization cas would continue to lay emphasis on innovative research on emerging technologies including but not limited to cyber and space we continue to enhance our reach through greater use of media seminars webinars digital technologies joint research and cementing our relationship with domestic regional and global partners inshallah in times ahead we will continue to build upon our achievements Ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered here today for the book launch ceremony of Pandemics and Public Value Management. The book debates the coronavirus pandemic was a scourge that left hardship, sorrow, and misery for many of us and imposed an immense strain on society. The global coronavirus pandemic pushed civil society, public managers, politicians, 
and society at large into uncharted waters. Based on public value theory, this book is a timely key as to how to proceed forward in the future. It presents this forward-looking perspective through an interesting amalgamation of lessons drawn from the pandemic, such as the life versus livelihood debate, infodemic and misinformation, challenges faced by international bodies, and vaccine nationalism during production and dissemination. At the end, the book presents a fascinating case study that makes an illustrative comparison of how Pakistan and India managed the pandemic. The book concludes, it was an unforgettable phase in our lives and the future pandemics can be managed in a better manner. So without further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker of the ceremony, Professor Carl Moore. Professor Carl Moore is a professor of strategy and organization at McGill University, Canada. Professor Moore joined McGill's faculty of management in autumn 2000, where he teaches graduate courses in strategy and leadership. He has taught extensively in executive education and MBA programs with leading universities, including Oxford, Stanford, Harvard, Cambridge, and Duke, to mention a few. Professor Moore's publications include 28 journal articles, 10 books and edited volumes, 14 chapters in books, 31 executive articles, and dozens of conference papers. I would now like to request Professor Moore to deliver his remarks. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be a CAS. I've visited uh, virtually a number of times and hoping to come this fall in person and meet some of the wonderful people there. Well, uh, one of my favorite students I've ever had is uh, Dr. Usman, as you know him. Uh, I've uh, put together a list with uh, one of my students. I've taught over 5,000 students at McGill since being here and about 1,000 at Oxford, and he stands out as one of the brightest, one of the most valuable. And I think this book just reconfirms uh, what a fine mind you are blessed to have in your presence over there. And it, very much a credit to Pakistan, as is his brother who uh, works here in Montreal, and his parents who were uh, wonderful ambassadors, literally ambassadors, but were great ambassadors and the best in the full sense of the word for Pakistan, uh, a family of enormous credit to your country. It's very as a, a fascinating book to read through on public value theory, that was very well written, accessible to people who are experts as well as non-experts in the field. And one of the central points he makes uh, at great length and very, very uh, helpfully and appropriately is how that our view of what public value is evolved enormously during the case of the pandemic. And he focuses on the case of Pakistan and India particularly, but looks around the world. And it's interesting because I teach at a business school here at McGill and in Oxford as well. And the view of the role of business has evolved enormously in the last 10 years. And I think during the pandemic, it continued to evolve. And this is, I think, a, an interesting parallel track to public value theory is that what is the purpose, the meaning of a corporation? Now, um, it's a big debate in the UK, the US, Canada, and Australia, and elsewhere. Uh, what's the point of a corporation? What is the value they bring? Uh, the traditional view, Milton Friedman's view, which still has some adherence, is that it's to produce shareholder value. Uh, I was down in Toronto with the National Bank, uh, one of the biggest banks in Canada. And what we did was an analyst day on Bay Street, which is the Canadian equivalent of Wall Street. So I took some of the top CEOs and CFOs of the big companies in Montreal down to Toronto, down to Bay Street, uh, to see hundreds of analysts. And it's something where the share price is a critical thing indeed. And executive compensation is based on that. But today we're taking a much broader view of the purpose of a corporation. It is no longer just to do shareholder value, but it's stakeholder value. And so that's why I found this book particularly interesting was the parallels between the business world and the world of public value, which would include, broadly speaking, corporations to some degree, the world is evolving and going to a different place because of the pandemic. And, and this was a trend that was already occurring 
but if you would, uh, was put on steroids by the pandemic to say, how are you getting literally food to consumers? So I interviewed the uh, CEO of Loblaws, one of the big uh, food companies here, uh, one of the big retailers, they have about 200,000 employees, and they were seen as essential workers during the pandemic because literally you needed to go there to get food. And they did not shut down for more than a day in the course of the pandemic. The essential workers, part of it, very much important. And it really highlighted people that we may not see as the most important society, but simply people that are stocking our shelves in the supermarket to provide food for the rest of us to survive and get by on. Um, UPS drivers, people like that, which we had not seen as important, but are central now to our society. I have a, a CEO class and a CEO radio show where I interview a CEO a week for an hour one-on-one -on -one, uh, across Canada. And I've interviewed about 100 plus CEOs since the pandemic. The early conversation is, when did you shut your organization down? Was one of the first questions. Then it evolved to, do you have a war room, a war cabinet? And almost all of them did in the early days, March and April, May and June of the pandemic. And it's evolved to a point where they're thinking about it differently. Just finished a book on Generation Z, and as a professor, I spend a lot of time for someone my age with 20-year-olds. I have eight of them working for me. So I'm older than most of you, and my workforce is younger unless you run a McDonald's. Uh, so it's something where I have a very young workforce, Generation Z, and they're looking for v purpose at work. Um, one of the famous bumper stickers of uh, the U.S., uh, we don't have bumper stickers in Canada, but they do in the U.S., and uh, is a famous one is, he who dies with the most toys wins, is a boomer view of the world. My students shake their head at the shallowness of the boomers. It doesn't matter how beautiful your suit is, what kind of car you drive. What it matters is your life has purpose and meaning. So the challenge to companies in North America and Europe is, how do you provide purpose to Z's? Otherwise, they're not going to work for you. Now, we probably have a recession coming, it appears, uh, from North American viewpoint. Um, but there's a war for talent for young people. My CEO class last year and the year before, this has never happened before, CEOs would say, Carl, can you send me some of your students? And they never asked this before, but there is an absolute war for talent. Our center Inc. just finishing a master's in data analytics at McGill. You can have zero personality and still get a job in data analytics. Like, it really doesn't matter. They're desperate. And CEOs will ask when I mention my son's name and said, oh, can you send them to work for me? Because there's such a war for talent in specific areas. But generally, young people are under huge demand, which means we've got to listen to them with greater clarity in the past. One of the key points, one of the key chapters in my book, based on hundreds of interviews of C-suite executives and hundreds of interviews of Zs, is that they're looking for purpose and meaning. So the value of what a corporation does, shareholder value, and as, a, as someone who uh, will retire someday and I've got stocks in my portfolio, I don't manage it, I, I'm not a finance prof, I have experts that manage that, but when you look at it, we're evolving to a place where purpose matters, that the value of a corporation is measured by Zs and increasingly by the stock market is what are you doing for the world? How are you making it a better place? Who are you helping out there? How are you promoting women? How are you promoting um, racial minorities? Which in Canada, about 5% of our population indigenous, about 4% is black and about 18% are Asian, uh, which is a, it's a, it's embarrassing that we say Asians and lump India, Pakistan, India, China, Taiwan, Korea, Japan all together as one. Because you know the world is so different just in Pakistan, let alone compared to you in China. But we have minorities here and making place for them in a society, if you're going to live in an immigrant society like Canada, we have to. So I love the book, The Evolution of Public Value is when we see paralleled in terms of corporate value and how we value corporations, how we think about them, and how we think they bring value to the world.
So hats off, doctor. Very much enjoyed it. You continue to write with great clarity and great insight. It was a pleasure to read. I'll turn the floor back now to our, our moderator. Thank you, Professor Moore, for your insightful deliberations. I would now like to welcome Professor Enrico Berchi. Professor Enrico Berchi is a professor of accounting at the University of Ferrara, Italy. He serves as a vice director of the Department of Economics and Management and vice director of Public Value Research Center. He is editorial board member of several journals, such as Accounting, Auditing and Accountability Journal, Journal of Accounting, Accountability in Emerging um, Economies, and Journal of Public Budgeting, Accounting and Financial Management. He is also an executive committee member of the Public Service Accounting and Accountability Group. Professor Birchi is co-editor of book series on public service accounting and accountability. I would now request Professor Birchi to come on Zoom to share his insights. Thank you. And thank you to Asman for the invitation. Um, and also thank to Karl Moore for his previous speech uh, that he addressed from a corporate point of view. Uh, my speech is that in debating and discussing about the topics of the book, which I certainly enjoyed. And uh, in, uh, in truth, this is the, the third book that I read by Osman. Uh, and this one, of course, uh, luckily I didn't need to buy it this time, but so thank you for providing me with a copy, but also my library has already ordered uh, copies for students as I truly enjoyed it in reading uh, and um, both for, for clarity and uh, the timely topics uh, that it addressed. As I said, um, I will uh, try to um, discuss uh, about the book's topics from a public service perspective. Uh, so public sector uh, organizations that, um, of course, from their standpoint, uh, they are always add uh, public value at their core. Uh, uh, comparison to corporations public service organization, of course, are there for a purpose, that is to serve society, to serve citizens uh, in the um, needs that are uh, deemed to be worth addressing by the society in, in, in the uh, social contract. And um, of course, the uh, most striking aspect that uh, I, uh, experience and uh, I, can, I, I found in the book is this concept of uh, public value uh, conflicts. Um, this, first of all, uh, lies versus livelihood perspective. But if we want also to enlarge uh, beyond life and livelihoods, but there are also other type of uh, values uh, <clears throat> like freedom, uh, rather than also privacy. I, I think each of us, at least in Italy, we at certain time we were asked uh, to use apps in order to trace where we were going. And of course that affected our privacy. There was a big debate about if that value uh, was to be protected or the life, uh, the, <clears throat> the contrast uh, to uh, COVID-19 was uh, preeminent rather than privacy. So I think public value conflicts uh, that I found in the book is the core. And uh, I, I think uh, it's something we need to, to, to debate on how public value, uh, public values emerge and then are um, deliver into society. And I, I'd like to remember 
going back to, to the basics. So one of the major scholars on public values is Bozeman. Uh, Bozeman uh, in his uh, work underlined the fact that uh, public values comes from a reflection in which we define uh, what are the rights, the benefits to which citizens are entitled, which is, of course, are differentiated country by country, and that are uh, dynamic changes over time. Second, that there is an obligation of citizen towards society, state, and, act, and uh, uh, others. Uh, on that reflection, it is important to underline that when we talk about public values, not just public service organization that have to provide those public value, but there is also a matter of co-production, collaboration between the state, public service organization in general, and citizens. We need to protect public values from also from the uh, uh, individual perspective. And trust. Trust is another key word that also emerge uh, during this pandemic. Trust is the glue that ties a society together. Trust between uh, citizens among them and between the citizen and the state. And uh, of course, then the third point that Bozeman underlined is related to the principles uh, on which government and policies uh, should be delivered and should uh, then uh, th then managed. Um, the COVID-19 put all these uh, aspects under pressure. And from reading the book, I, I think we can observe also in the chapter related to the post-truth uh, public disvalue, which is a very important uh, perspective of analysis, not just on how public value can be protected, produced, but also uh, the way in which can be destroyed. So public value, this value is a, a very important. And during the COVID-19, I think we all observed how uh, there's been a public value displacement, public value clash, things that we thought to be um, granted, they needed to be protected, they, they needed to be displaced in order to uh, guarantee the primacy to some other values. Um, and also we observed that uh, the outcome of this public value clash or displacement had very different outcomes in different countries, different states. Which again tells us on how public value is a key issue that needs to be st uh, started from an international comparison. We that's why I've truly appreciated the last chapter of the book, comparing uh, the case of the Indian case and the Pakistan case. And in uh, studying from uh, an international comparison perspective is very important when we are talking about public value. The, in that way, we can observe the differences in which, uh, in which way public value uh, emerge in a country, the way it is created or it is not created, it destroyed depending on uh, the the content and. Um, I think what we are observing that something that we need to be started in future is to see whether and how in different countries or in a, also a different level of analysis. Because I think another uh, perspective that uh, Usman always had in his books is providing uh, a multi-level analysis at the organizational point of view, national point of view, but also supranational, uh, supranational point of view. And uh, as far as Italy is concerned, that is very relevant because as you know, 
uh, Italy is part of the European Union. And um, uh, being part of a supranational uh, union affected the way COVID-19 was addressed. And what then uh, the uh, capability of intervention and protection of values, as uh, we have seen in the European uh, context. So this multi-level analysis is very important because we can appreciate the changes in public value and values uh, at different levels at different times. And um, one, um, two last points um, before closing. Um, I think, uh, as I said, COVID-19 repre uh, has represented an external shock that for some countries also uh, affected uh, the way in which they valued things. We need to remember that public values are not fixed, they change over time, and they mostly change after heavy shocks, external shocks, like war, uh, pandemics, or other. So it will be important to observe the changes in values, what is valued. And so the changes in society, in the role of the state, and the role of um, the, uh, the society at large. Also observing the risk of uh, what is called in the literature, the disembedded society, economy, sorry, disembedded economy. That is when democracy and the public interest is trumped by economic concern. That is when the economics drives all the um, uh, policy choices, and in that sense, not protecting uh, other values. Last but not least, from one research that I carried out during the COVID-19, what I have observed, observed is also uh, a process of uh, hybridization of public values, in a sense that uh, particularly at the organizational level, public managers had to decide from one day to the other how to act. Just take, for example, what we did at the university. In one week, we reverse our teaching from uh, in presence 100% to online 100%. In one week, there was no choice. So we decided straight to protect that particular value that is a guarantee students with teaching. But then things started to change and we felt that it was not only important to allow students to attend, but also to create value through uh, distance learning. And then we started to hybridize this principle of uh, guarantee uh, education at a distance at any costs to other values, like guarantee uh, the quality, uh, guarantee also the effectiveness and other values in delivering uh, online teaching. This, of course, uh, uh, we resume in presence, but that experience in which values at the beginning were purified and then hybridized in this process. So to conclude, uh, um, and going back to uh, Hasman's book, uh, as I said, uh, very timely, uh, insightful, uh, um, and also, after reading the other two books, coherent uh, with the uh, series that he launched uh, with his public value, uh, public value, value books. So that I invite everybody to 
uh, to go through and to read because a public value will continue to be at the center of the policy level. But as we uh, heard by Karl Moore also from a corporate perspective, as uh, with the, uh, the econ economic uh, environmental issues globally, of course, public sector organization, but also cooperation are key actors in uh, delivering, creating, and then try to avoid the destruction of public value. So thanks, Asman, for this great effort in this book. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I leave the word to the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Berchi, for sharing your views. I would now like to invite Professor Anna Santos Richman. Professor Richman has been assistant professor at St. Louis University and is now promoted to the rank of professor at Villanova University in the United States. She has published and presented widely on topics related to health law, food and drug regulation, intellectual property, innovation in life sciences, and law and technology. Her recent presentations have covered topics related to vaccines, other biotechnology, healthcare blockchain, e-health, and artificial intelligence in medicine. Her ongoing book, Vaccines as Technology, Innovation, Barriers, and Public Interest is under contract with Cambridge University Press. She has sent a pre-recorded message for us today. Hello, I'm Dr. Anna Rutschman, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, albeit virtually um, today. Um, I am an assistant professor of law at St. Louis University Center for Health Law Studies and International and Comparative Law, and I'll be um, performing that role for the remainder of this week. And then next week, I become professor of law at Villanova University, um, also in the United States in the Philadelphia area. So if you're ever in the Philadelphia area, um, I welcome you there. And in particular, um, Dr. Chan, the author of this wonderful book that we're celebrating um, today, we hope to host you at some point should you come to the United States. I'm positive you'd find uh, audiences that are very interested in what uh, you have to say and your very comprehensive uh, work on this topic. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to do my part uh, for today, which is provide a very brief introduction um, to the book. And I prepared some slides. So I'm going to um, share my screen with, um, with you. So here we go. And um, Obviously, um, you are by now, I hope, familiar with, uh, with the book, which is incredibly, incredibly uh, timely, and it, it intersects with so many um, areas, scholarly and practical um, areas, um, that have invested a lot of time and effort in understanding how we can deal better with the next pandemic, which we know is uh, going to happen, unfortunately, uh, and probably before not too long as pandemics do, but also we can, we can prepare better for um, public health crises, which has um, Dr. Chan points out throughout the book are not merely public health um, crises. They also take a toll on multiple other areas. Um, and, and that's one of the contributions, one of the many contributions of this, uh, of this book. Um, these are just some of the highlights that I found uh, throughout the book, as I mentioned um, in, my, in my brief introduction. Um, I'm a law professor and I work also with uh, policy issues, mainly from a public health um, perspective. So these bullet points are not meant to encapsulate everything that the book does, which is a whole um, lot. Um, I'm just highlighting a few things that resonated in particular with uh, with me and that I suspect will resonate with people in the public health law and policy um, uh, space. And even though I have never worked myself with public value um, theory, I could not 
uh, not highlight um, the um, the contribution of the book in this uh, in this area because it helps to populate the nascent uh, field and and one that is providing very useful frameworks for us to understand where preparedness for uh, upcoming health crisis uh, might uh, be experiencing some problems. So it's it's more than a, a theoretical uh, approach that uh, Dr. Chan um, highlights comprehensively in in the chapter um, on, on public value, but also throughout um, the book, I really think this is a tool to understand what has gone wrong and what can go better and prepare better for um, pandemics uh, it is something we uh, we desperately need to learn uh, how to do. Um, so one of the things I'm not going to linger on as I go through the other um, slides, but that I definitely must start that. There um, is how the book um, adds a very, very well-researched um, and coherently framed uh, approach to public value theory and lays out how it, um, how it plays out in the field of pandemics and large-scale public health um, crises. We don't need a, a pandemic um, to, to resort to this uh, theoretical uh, framework. A, a large-scale uh, public health crisis and epidemic, a transnational um, outbreak of an infectious disease, uh, pose a lot of the same problems that pandemics do, as Dr. Chohan um, highlights throughout the book um, as well. The second thing that I would like to uh, highlight, uh, which I think is perfectly encapsulated in this um, um, in this um, expression, lives versus livelihoods, is something that probably is still very, very uh, fresh in our collective and individual memories because virtually every country on earth has experienced this dilemma. Um, this divide, which I put the word apparent uh, there, because I think one of the important contributions of the book is to explain how competing values um, sometimes can be reconciled and sometimes there are ways to prioritize um, interventions when we have to cater to competing uh, values. And again, public value theory uh, is, is of help um, there. But I think lives versus livelihoods reminds each one of us um, here today of many of the dilemmas that we faced over the past two and a half um, years. So public health is about preparedness and quick response and the articulation of competing stakeholders, which might be all in the same country at the domestic level or spread across um, borders. Uh, but we have to come quickly and make decisions that will impinge on individual freedoms and on the economy, trade, and, and the like. And I have more to say on this in just a, a moment, but there is what appears often to be a divide that cannot be reconciled. And one of the contributions of the book is to first explain uh, how these two seemingly separate um, areas actually overlap and have to work together during a pandemic so that we don't bring the economy to a complete shutdown, uh, but also as we curb disease, which again, we need, we need to do and prepare to do in the future. The third thing I'd like to highlight is the role of transnational um, actors. Uh, the book has a case study on the World Health um, Organization. And I, I think one of the major contributions of this book is that it's one of the earliest in, in, this, uh, in these early waves um, of um, scholarly contributions uh, on a world that's now marked by misinformation and disinformation at a scale that we have not known before. Although misinformation and disinformation are not new phenomena, phenomena um, they are now uh, via the internet and other digital uh, tools being deployed in ways that we collectively are not familiar with historically, and these international uh, or transnational actors now have to contend with, uh, with that. And this is one of the first works in which I see that integrated into um, scholarly uh, analysis. And then finally, the international um, slash domestic conundrum. And by this, I mean that if we for a moment set aside some of the other things I've been discussing, which are international in, in, in nature, the response to um, disinformation about health, for instance, or about the pandemic, uh, and this idea that the economy itself, it's not uh, at this point um, realistic to be talking of just solely domestic economies or something to uh, add to that, to that and relationship uh, at trade and economic level between um, countries. If we set that aside for uh, a moment, there's still, uh, and again, I'm a law professor, so my mind um, had to go there. There's still a problem of coordination between policies 
politics, even in laws at the international level versus the domestic uh, level with actors often not cooperating um, as public health principles or economic principles for that matter would like them um, to. Um, so, and this is yet another area that the book contributes to. So what I'm going to do in the time that I have um, left is to go through the three main um, bullet points. Um, I don't have much to um, add uh, in terms of public value theory in which uh, Dr. Chauhan is certainly um, an expert, uh, but I will um, share with you some of the thoughts that came to mind on the lives versus livelihoods, um, the role of transnational actors and international uh, slash domestic conundrum um, areas of the book. And again, this does not fully encapsulate everything that the book touches on, uh, but some of the things that stood out to me and I think to people with uh, my uh, background or working in, the, in these fields. Uh, on the topic of lives versus livelihoods, um, there's um, something that um, public value um, theory focuses on that resonates uh, both in public health, but in other areas of law and, and policy. And this is the idea, the idea that we have competing values. We have objectives that in themselves are worth uh, pursuing. We want a vibrant economy at the domestic level and at that transnational level, and we want healthy populations. So these are competing goals and they're both good uh, goals. So what happens when the world, when the worlds collide? Uh, and I'm using economy here to encapsulate um, the livelihood portion, um, as Dr. Chohan calls it, of this uh, debate. So we want to prevent disease, the onset of disease, and we want to respond as efficiently as we can um, to the outbreak of disease. That's the life's part of um, the equation. And then we have um, what I call the economy or livelihoods in Dr. Chohan's uh, words, uh, but also think about uh, trade, think about labor and other areas that are impacted by the imposition of the most stringent kind of public health me measures from um, complete shutdowns, which we experienced um, here in the United States, um, to restrictions on um, labor laws and what you can do in your uh, workplace, or to commerce, right? For which businesses get to be open and for how long, how many restrictions we're going to place in terms of capacity and the like. So these are all things that under normal circumstances are legal to regulate, are desirable um, from a practical perspective, but they're clashing at this point, the imposition of public health measures and the economy. And I think one of the important points that the book does that I often don't see in, um, um, in, in um, scholarship, uh, and, and some types of scholarship, I should say, is not only the characterization of the lives and the livelihoods portion of this puzzle, but also the idea that this is not really a divide, right? We, we tend to think of this as one or the other, or how much of one, how much of the other. But really, this is a false dichotomy, and the book makes a very important um, contribution there, because really, these are interconnected areas of law, of policy, of politics and of life in, in general, of living in a, in a society collectively. Um, so I think that's a, an extremely important um, contribution that the book makes. And I'm going to just add something on the law side of things since that's my uh, background, because I think the book underscores something that um, if nothing else, uh, you know, law offers a proof of. And that's the idea that the laws and policies that we have historically past to encourage things like biomedical innovation. So the laws that serve as incentives for companies and individuals to create new diagnostics, personal protective equipment, vaccines and treatments, which broadly fall under the umbrella of intellectual property and patent law that reward innovation. These laws that are set at the international level and are adopted by virtually every country in, in the world, they're intellectual property laws. They regulate health goods. But when we pass things like the TRIPS agreement or the Doha Declaration on Public Health, which attaches to the TRIPS uh, agreement, the intellectual property framework we all use, we attach that to trade laws. So the laws that were designed to incentivize the production of health goods, any type of health goods from medicines to medical devices, 
if there is any problem regarding infringement of intellectual property, those are litigated through um, trade channels. The international IP agreement that you see highlighted here, the IP agreement that we call TRIPS, it's actually part of the World um, Trade Organization system, um, and it's administered uh, by trade-related international organizations. So this is something that came to mind as I went through um, the book and the portion of the book in which Dr. Chohan dissected the different areas of lives and livelihoods um, that are affected by pandemics and large-scale epidemics. And I just wanted to offer this um, supporting idea that we know in international policy making, if nothing else, that the two things are related, that a healthy world is um, actually uh, not incompatible with more than that, has to be compatible uh, with measures that are designed to keep our economies um, strong. And I think that moving forward, this suggests that we still need public health responses and uh, hopefully uh, not just responses to public health crises, but also preparedness. So things we do to lessen the impact of future pandemics and epidemics, we have to prepare for those. They're going to come, they're going to be needed, but they have to be tailored, right? Uh, we want the least possible stringent form of public health um, intervention. Uh, and as long as we keep that need for tailoring uh, in, in mind. I think we just have to go about our future lives thinking that these interventions are critical, not just to public health, but also to the economy, to trade, and to labor-related goals, because the COVID-19 pandemic certainly posed a toll on all of these um, areas, which I'm calling economy here in the bottom, trade and labor, uh, and Dr. John called um, livelihoods. My second to last thought is on the role of transnational um, actors, and I'm going to be brief um, here uh, for, the, uh, for the sole reason that the case study on the World Health Organization that the book uh, focuses on, I'm not going to comment uh, on it. I'm currently a consultant to the World Health Organization. Um, and this does not mean that I don't think that the organization itself has a whole lot to learn. Um, I think it does. Um, I, I think it has many things it can improve on, uh, but um, I, I don't want um, to comment on it due to a current conflict of, uh, of interests, but I highly recommend uh, that uh, you go through this, uh, this case study. And I want to suggest that some of the findings uh, in this portion of the book are actually applicable to other transnational actors, right? some of them um, slightly different in, in, in structure. So in, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw CEPI and um, CTAP. Um, CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and um, CTAP uh, is also uh, a platform that brings together public private actors international at the international um, level so we had multiple types of international actors dr um Chahan focuses on an international organization, one that uh, has a long um, history. And I want to suggest that a lot of these findings also are applicable to more recent um, transnational actors and some of them that don't really take um, the form of a WHO or similar, but they might just be a public, an international public private partnership as the two that I have highlighted um, here. And I also think that the findings of this case study are applicable to organizations operating in the public health um, space, even if there's no pandemic or epidemic. So CARB-X focuses on the um, production um, and allocation of um, medicines and other health goods needed to combat um, um, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, that's what the acronym um, stands for. And GAVI is a Geneva-based, like WHO, uh, a, a Geneva-based uh, vaccine, uh, childhood vaccine uh, procurement uh, organization. So again, they're not exactly structured in the same way that an organization like the World Health Organization is, but they share many of the virtues and the coordinating virtues at the international level and many of the faults of the World Health Organization. Um, because some of them are more gargantuan than others, they take some time to respond um, to um, um, to the need that they need to, to face simply because there's some degree of coordination that needs to be achieved. They need a certain degree of funding that's not necessarily always easy to, to guarantee. They're not exempt from 
um, politics, from the political economy, from controversy. Uh, we saw the U.S. threatening to leave the World Health Organization during the pandemic. Um, so I just want to suggest that what we read about in this um, case study is applicable um, elsewhere, and I would direct people at these organizations to read the book, and I'll be promoting this um, book uh, widely also at that level. And I also want to say, as I did in the introduction, that these transnational organizations are very, very uh, are contending with a new phenomenon. And one of the things we know from the literature is that they're having some difficulty in responding to misinformation and disinformation. That's something that Dr. Chohan talks about quite a bit in the, um, uh, in the book. And it's again, one of the first scholarly accounts of that, uh, of that phenomenon because it's much easier and faster to promote health-related myths and disinformation than it is to verify uh, data, produce a credible uh, accounts and disseminate it. So this is a, an emerging challenge that these organizations, not just the World Health Organization, have to contend with in the near future. And as the book also mentions, there is a, an accountability and transparency, transparency deficit um, at many of these uh, organizations. It's not exclusive to the realm of public health, but it's something that the book draws attention to. And I think that's an important um, debate for, again, the World Health Organization and beyond. And finally, I'll end with the international slash domestic uh, conundrum. Uh, a lot of the problems we see have to do with the fact that public health disease in general uh, knows no uh, physical um, or sovereign um, borders, and yet laws and policies really do operate across lines that were artificially um, drawn, sometimes with good reason, sometimes perhaps not, uh, but that's how they tend to, um, to operate. And this gives rise to uh, the phenomenon of vaccine nationalism, which chapter five focuses on. So the idea that countries are buying vaccines and for that matter, other, other health goods um, as any type of widget, any type of gadget, right? They're not buying them as health products per se, they're negotiating them as commodities and Economics 101 dictates that the countries with the greatest um, purchasing um, power and perhaps um, know how in terms of repeat connections with the suppliers of these goods will always win vis-a-vis -vis the countries um, that might have a greater public health need but don't have the same type of, uh, of resources. And this ties to the phenomenon that Professor Halliby here in the US calls viral sovereignty. So this idea that, again, some of the things we might need to produce these vaccines and health goods might be available in a country, right? And some countries have tried to assert sovereignty again saying because this was found within my territory, I'm going to withhold these samples that might be needed to understand the disease or to produce a pharmaceutical um, product. So this is the other conundrum uh, we're facing, and I personally have been working a lot um, in, in this area. And moving forward, we really need a way to negotiate the fair allocation of, um, of health goods. We've experienced that with uh, vaccines in this pandemic and the previous pandemic, as um, Dr. Chohan describes in, um, in the book. And I dearly hope that we take to heart um, the um, things, uh, the, the phenomena, the problems that Dr. Chohan um, surveys in, in the book. Um, the account certainly offers a lot of food for thought, and I think this is a, a very important uh, first step in getting a whole lot of different uh, players from mere law professors like me to people at these international organizations to society at large um, to thinking about uh, what we can do better the next time around and we cannot do better if we don't understand um, what's happening on the ground during the pandemic and the epidemic. So thank you, Dr. Chohan, for writing this book. It was a, a pleasure to read it. And I hope to meet you in person uh, at some point. But in, in the meantime, um, I will remain a fan uh, of your work. Thank you, Professor Richmond. I would now like to invite Dr. Osman Chohan Dr. Osman Chohan is an international economist and an academic who serves as Director of Economic Affairs and National Development at GAPS. He's among the top 10 business authors on Social Science Research Network, which is the largest open repository of knowledge in the world. He has published four books in four years, and in the academic realm, his research has been cited widely. Pandemics and Public Value was Dr. Osman's fourth book at CAS, 
and his forthcoming fifth book is titled Activist Retail Investors and the Future of Financial Markets. I would now like to invite the author of the book so we can give so he can give us a deeper insight. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Enrico, Carl, and Anna, for taking the time to participate in this event virtually. I'm very grateful that I was able to find the best people uh, to join me for this. The title of the book is Pandemics and Public Value Management. So you have for pandemics, Anna Richmond. You have for management, Carl Moore. And for public value, you have Enrico Bracci. So you really get the best and they read this book. I knew that these are three people who actually read it and they did. And they all came across with different lessons from reading the same text. So that's part of the magic. Now I'll give you my narrative as well. So. Background, chapter discussions and then some conclusion, straightforward. Um, it's my fourth book, it's my best one, I swear to God, because I don't think I'll be able to write something as passionately, having been a part of it, uh, as, as we all were. Pandemic is a very specific time. 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, you'll be telling younger people, oh, you don't know what it was like in 2020. And we'll exaggerate with stories, it's unique. 55,000 words, um, and the logic behind it was that as the pandemic unfolded, the early days, I noticed that public value scholars were writing as if, what do I mean? And nothing has happened, no pandemic. I said, really, no pandemic at all? Why isn't work being done on this? Because if you ask me, there's a million things one can write about that are public value informing the pandemic and the pandemic informing public value, reciprocally, as academia should be. So I said, well, I'll just put the six best ideas and work with them. I said, but there's no shortage of this stuff. That was the logic behind it. The work ended up being somewhere between science and the social science. And from the uh, esteemed panel that we have today, you'll see that there's a law professor, there's a management professor, and there's an accounting professor, and they all uh, enrich the discussion through their perspectives on the work. Essentially, there's an intro and a conclusion, naturally, but there are five themes that I picked within it. The first one, which you saw from the presentation, is value concept. Everybody expresses and holds values and societies as a whole then in aggregation reflect them. But there's a conflict. For example, when the pandemic has come, there is a value that I have a right to my freedom, so I won't follow these lockdowns. That's my right, I value freedom. But the other one is restraint. And if, I, if I do this, somebody else's life could be saved because I won't have different values. The big one is lives versus livelihood. So the logic behind it, I'll go in the subsequent thing is either you prioritize health or you prioritize the economy. Why? Because if you keep the economy open, you could damage the health. If you work only on health, you lock everything down, the economy goes to hell. That's the, it's not easy to balance that, but there's nuance to it. The chapter three was post-truth era. So what is really the science behind COVID? was an issue that was a kind of piñata. People were kidded about misinformation. I picked the case study of Brazil. There were three you know, electoral autocracies that you could pick from. You could pick Trump, you could pick Modi, you could pick Bolsonaro. The United States, I've done a lot of public value work already, but kind of boring. India, I saved for the comparison, the comparative thing. So then I worked on Bolsonaro and Bolsonarism as an idea. 
And then chapter four is a case study of the WHO because you would have thought that like in previous epidemics or pandemics, there is a United Nations affiliate or branch that would lead the charge, like they eradicated smallpox, yellow fever, West Nile virus, so many things, the WHO was the star. This time, Trump says, I'm going to leave this institution. I don't care about them, they're liars. So where is that leadership in the world? That's why you have to study what is the value that they create and what do they articulate the values of which public, the world public, or the, that's the trickiness that I dealt with. It is a kind of boring chapter, but it is worthwhile, as you saw from Anna's discussion, that it does speak to other agencies. That was her interpretation. Vaccine nationalism, I think heavily on. My thinking was informed heavily by Professor Richman um, because she has done a lot of work on vaccine nationalism. And it became a very irritating thing at the time that I was coming to the midway of the book. You can prioritize your own public because you produce vaccines. Let's say you're a developed country that can do it. But there is an excess nationalism and you don't give the vaccines out at all, right? And there's a reason, for example, that Omicron emerged somewhere that vaccines were not taken on. So there's a reason for that. It's not coincidental. Nationalism is the idea. So which public are we trying to protect? We as a world are one public, but then this mohalla is a public. That's the problem, international and national, which um, Enrico kindly observed to be the multi-layered analysis. And finally, comparative PEV. For us in the audience here today, I think this has been the most interesting one. India's COVID journey is worlds apart from ours, there are reasons for that. And I want to bear testament to that so that when people read this in the future, they see that they were, we are not so different from them genetically, economically, but in a world we're living two different dimensions in terms of COVID, why? Public value is what I use to find the answers to that. So that is the most important chapter in my judgment. Okay. So we start with the premise that fortunately there's no vaccine for stupidity. I saw a lot of stupidity. And so public value can help to deal with this idea. Uh, this is particularly true for chapter three and the post -trip. Okay. If you prioritize lives, it means you close everything down. If you prioritize livelihood, you maintain a normalcy in the economy and it's one or the other. Some politicians particularly like to frame it. Not here, but abroad. If you, then you look to the arguments that if you lie, well, humans first, there's no economy outside of uh, human experience, so you have to prioritize humans. That's a lives argument. Losses, if people die, that is a greater economic loss, an actuarial loss. And it's bi-directionality isn't there. So if you go veer towards public health, you won't be able to go back to the economy that people will be dead. It only goes one way. If you, once you prioritize the economy, then the economy is that people have died. Up and down. That's the and um, as some people, including myself, say there's no practical or ethical sense in this trade-off, right? On the livelihoods thing, there are valid concerns too. That's why it becomes a philosophical chapter. Some citizens may articulate a genuine legitimate need for openness. For example, if you are a bikea rider or somebody who needs to be mobile to deliver to earn a basic living, okay, your grandmother is safe, but you are going hungry, right? I mean, some people have a genuine need to do their work, no matter what. There is a greater damage, is an argument, from just locking down an entire city. Shanghai is a recent example. 20 million people, you lock every person down? There's such thing as going too far. And you know what? Desperation and hunger can kill 100% of people. COVID fatality rate is 2%. Hunger will kill 100%. So this is what I tried to balance in it. And in addition to the lives and livelihood, as the chapter does, there's other conflicts. Your sense of duty to others, but your sense of freedom. Economically restraint, so you have to save for the future, or relief. When people are suffering, you have to spend heavily. And many countries spend heavily. Some people, some, some governments felt spent heavily and stupidly. Some spent moderately and prudently. Like this one. It was a limited stimulus package, but it was very clear. Oversight and privacy. So some countries have these sort of cameras or apps watching over you, and then there's a right to privacy. I don't want the government to know where I am. Empathy and self-preservation. Epistemic truth and relativism. That was so important that it became chapter three itself. Efficiency versus equity. So the most efficient solution is often not the most equal one or iniquitous, right? 
But if you focus a lot on equity, that often is an inefficient solution. So finding ways to deal with COVID requires trade-offs that are tricky. So that's why this chapter is valuable. I'm grateful that all the previous speakers referred to it, if it matters a lot as a chapter. It's also quite a long one. Okay. Post-truth era, on this graph, the United States is green, Brazil is blue, India is yellow, Pakistan is a dark green. Brazil stands up. Wow. This guy, his government, but it isn't so easy to just point the finger at one person and say he's a bad guy. There are systems of conflict within all countries, including in Brazil, between those who were on his side, which is to say, this is all nonsense, let's have a good time. Gripezinha, gripezinha means the chota sabuka, halka sabuka, it's no big deal, gripezinha. And there were people in the same sorts of functions in society which fought against it. For example, Bolsonaro's government, this is where I posit a new idea in public value, which is the there's a strategic triangle, then you have a triangle of disvalue. How did the destruction happen? Which talks about the conflict. So he had what's called the office of hatred. That uh, abused everybody who was not on your side, but oppositional politicians fought back, um, particularly at the state level, not just at the federal level. In Brazil, the executive machinery was working for Bolsonaro's ideas. We do not let it go, it doesn't matter. But the judiciary, the courts, played a very big part in saying, this is nonsense. If the Sao Paulo court will say, no, we will have the lockdown. This tension is a very important lesson for how government or public values agents fight. At civil society level, there were some mega pastor churches and populists who were totally on board with him. They give him a lot of votes. A big following in the evangelical community, for example. But there were healthcare advocacy groups and media people who were saying what is happening is wrong. So it's a very interesting case. If there are two parallel societies. Polarization is a big uh, worry for all societies, including ours. This was a perfect example of the disvalue created by it. Chapter four, who, hello, who, we know who we are, who, the WHO, uh, what is its value? I already said why I picked it. So it produces global public goods. It manages, and this is the most important one, cross-border externalities. COVID can hop boundaries without a visa. So that's where it starts to mean that a global leader has to do something about this, or people have to work in unison under an expert leadership that it couldn't do at maximum. Mobilizing global solidarity and offering global health stewardship. I ended up reading about 100,000 words on the WHO to write this chapter. And so it ends up being a dull chapter, but you can highlight the challenges of the WHO. There is Gebriezus, um, the Ethiopian head of the WHO, and he's in a straitjacket because he was hamstrung in terms of what he could do. The first thing is the incentivization problem. So countries have different incentives to deal with the WHO. Poor countries have generally used the WHO since its inception to articulate their needs. It ended up being a very pro-poor organization. So rich countries then pushed back against it. The imbalances between member states. If Trump said, I'll just cut off the funding, but what happens to their budget? Private power is a very interesting idea because a lot of work is being done, which is very interesting by, for example, the Bill Gates Foundation on malaria on WHO. But you see in terms of post truth, Bill Gates is treated like Satan on social media. So private power, is it good? Is it bad? Whose values? Who's, who does Bill Gates, who has elected Bill Gates to do this stuff? Nobody. So that these issues are treated in quite detail. In it. Relations with other multilaterals is very interesting because as I said, if the poor countries are using WHO, uh, the rich countries will use the World Bank. And the World Bank introduced different healthcare approaches that are actually contradictory. So WHO, w, what, the point being that in this arena where one expert authority could be, there's 10 authorities. That's it. Historically and in COVID, it became much worse. So I do the strategic triangle analysis to arrive what is in the second column because they have a partial legitimacy, partial recognition of value and partial operational resources. And that's why it made a partial positive contribution. Chapter five, very quickly, there is a limit to right national priorities who are elected by your people to make decisions for them, but there is a bigger issues of solidarity and the nature of the scientific process by which viruses transmit across boundaries that makes it all a kind of silly idea. So the, I, I, I do discuss, there is legitimate vaccine nationalism, but then there's a boundary beyond that. Public value is very useful. 
And finally, this one I can go into a bit more detail because it is interesting. These are two countries and they are both young. Let's call them, let's roll for. They have young people, we have young people. And old people only 5%, we have uh, elderly 4%. Our obesity rate is 8-ish percent. Theirs is 4 because they're vegetarian. Even better than us. So actually they look kind of good and not so different. Um, immunization for BCG, uh, we have 86%, they have 92%. We are 37% urban. They're not so different on paper. So what happened that we are so different in COVID from them? How did that happen? We have nine doctors per people, we have eight doctors per 10,000 people. Yet the graph shows a different story. I mean, it's catastrophic. Uh, when it's cases and when it's deaths. I'll repeat graph. To remind you, we should actually do Pakistan first. Imran Khan at the time said, we can't block everything down. It's not possible because they starve. It doesn't make sense. There was no politician who made any anti-COVID speech in this country, to my knowledge, none. Even in civil society, people believe personally there were no mass strikes like in other countries. Civil society did not do it. And the public managers were efficiently centralized in the NCOC, which took civil, military experts, the provincial, you know, the federal authorities. Everybody is coordinated and centralized response, which is the ideal format to deal with disasters. And where a poor country would struggle with governmental resources, civil society has to step in and hear amongst society coming towards mutual aid. There was a lot done in COVID. It's quite remarkable. Civil society, this is a big lesson for public value. Civil society can play a bigger role in developing countries than developed countries. And so you look at the multi-actor triangle and you have all the elements. Whatever tools we had, we used to the best. The state bank stimulus program was targeted using the Benazir infant support program, etc. A small percentage of her GDP and it's a small excellent amount, but it went to the people who deserved it most. Similarly, you have a rural support program, which is kind of a polio architecture realigned towards uh, COVID. So whatever you had, you use best. You can do remarkable things if you are all on the same page of preserving public value. What happened in a neighboring country? At a four hours notice, their prime minister says every street, every village, had gali, had given a bank for three weeks. So if you are told that 9 p.m. Uh, you won't be uh, able to go anywhere for the next three weeks, it's, there's hell to pay. So people fled the cities, knowing that the civil society mutual aid wasn't there. They had a caste problem. Why should I take care of lower caste people? This psychology exists. Why should I take care of this Muslim? This attitude is very damaging because they don't act as a singular public that has to work together. The um, politicians were very denialist about it. The fund that they created for it, the PM Cares Fund, and charges of embezzlement, corruption, it's all a nonsense. And the center didn't act uh, in a unified fashion. Instead, each state had to do it. So when states do it, some will do well, some will do poorly. Kerala, for example, did fine, but Madagascar was on reputation. I mean, it's all a mixed bag. And so um, when I have to use a rubric of values to assess what was done right and what was done right. Well, we will give five out of five to Pakistan, but zero out of five to India. So let history bear witness that when you want to work together in a concerted manner, this is what is possible. And that is the chapter six. I encourage you, if you get the time to at least read that one. And that's what this book entails. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Osman. The floor is open for question and answer session. Um, I will take three questions in a, at a time and please introduce yourself first.
Haremos más millones. You can introduce yourself and please be a bit louder. Um, Enrico uh, and Carl, did you hear me? Yes, I can hear when you are speaking from that mic. Yes, uh, I cannot hear the rest of the audience. Yes, so I will just repeat the summary of the three questions. Thanks. Um, Thank you. If, you. if you would like to answer them. The first relates to has capitalism's nature changed in a in major way since the, since the pandemic erupted? Do you feel? The second question was, do you think that hardcore lockdowns as we just witnessed in, for example, Shanghai, in April, such tough measures at this stage, do they show any lesson drawing or is it just sort of autopilot? The third one was about religion. So what sort of role do you think religion has played in public values during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. You'd like to take that. Well, uh, I, I will leave to Carl more maybe the, the first one uh, about uh, capitalism. I may try to uh, chip in uh, in the last two. Um, so this, the second one uh, relates to uh, one of the, the major uh, heavy measures against COVID-19, heavy lockdown. And uh, uh, I experienced heavy lockdown uh, in the first month of the pandemic uh, where we, well, maybe less, less heavy than China, uh, the Chinese one, but still heavy. Um, and I think that um, um, we learn uh, that may, maybe that one cannot be um, the solution. As I said, uh, if we want to um, um, maintain public values, uh, that means um, um, letting, avoiding what happened during the COVID, uh, the heavy lockdown, that is also differentiating uh, the, the, the burden of heavy lockdown uh, across society. I think we need to learn on how to manage uh, future, uh, future pandemics with some restrictions, with some responsibility of in, at the individual level, but uh, from my experience and also the debate that is going on uh, has shown that having lockdown without a, a collaboration uh, between institutions uh, uh, and individuals, uh, heavy lockdown is not the solution. Uh, and the third one, I think um, religion, of course, uh, religions uh, affects societies in terms of values. And uh, of course, Italy has a, a, a Catholic tradition, uh, which I would say um, considers uh, affected the way which we reacted to uh, COVID-19 and the way we try to care for the others as well, particularly eld older elderly people. Uh, of course, I don't have experience in other countries, but I can say that, of course, religion has a role as uh, uh, 
is it brings values across a society. I leave to Mark for the first question about uh, capitalism. I have my view, but is more on corporate strategy, and so it may give a be a better insights. Well, I'll comment and now uh, appreciate uh, Enrico's comments. It seems that like capitalism is in the midst of changing before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic accelerated it as there was more of a sense of what's happening to the world, a bit of a sense of community, uh, that you're part of a neighborhood, you're part of a community, a global community, but a very local community. On the other hand, is um, people uh, could only talk to their neighbors. So we started a thing where we'd have uh, um, a beverage on Friday night in front of uh, uh, the house by the park, David's house and Marion's house. And we get there safely distanced on our lawn chairs, having a drink and chatting about life. And there was a closeness to the community that had been lacking there. So I think there's that was accelerated by it. We also have um, working from home. So that's changing how do we enculturate people, how do we make them part of an organization. And people are more apt to leave more rapidly. That's partly Generation Z and younger millennials. But it's also the nature of work has evolved during COVID-19. And we think about work a bit differently and where we work from. And going down to tall t uh, buildings in the city center is something which is occurring, but less than it did in the past. So there's a very interesting evolution to capitalism in terms of connection to an organization and how much time you actually spend there. And uh, I would echo some of uh, Enrico's comments about religion is that in Canada, it's atheistic and Christian. And the Christian part would argue for caring for your neighbor. One of the central ideas of Judaism, of Islam as well, is caring and loving your neighbor. On the other hand, we saw in some of the right-wing uh, Christian churches in the U.S., uh, fired up by Trumpism, uh, ignoring, and a few churches just meeting together against the law and some pastors being arrested. So there's kind of some um, extremists on the right-hand side. But the central view of religion and its better moments would be to caring for your neighbor and during the COVID-19 care for the elderly neighbor. Make sure the widow has got some food and things like that. And we saw that occurring in our neighborhood at a very micro level. So I would echo some of the thoughts uh, that our colleague in Italy had. Back to you. Thank you. Um, I'm going um, with, uh, Professor Moore, uh, Professor Branchenship. Um, religion has had a positive and negative impact depending on where you are. Here, civil society has the Judeo-Christian Islamic values of mutual aid. But at the same time, the case study of Brazil shows that the mega pastors there were part of the problem. So I echo that. As far as capitalism, uh, sir, I will save this question for my next book, which is the title Future of Financial Markets. Mm -hmm. But what Professor Moore said is essentially true. My uh, focus in that is about the retail investor. So capitalism has a much more digital element now, and it has a bit of a whimsical element, the meme stocks and people going wild and trying to sabotage the markets, but still situated in the logic of capitalism. They just want a quick cut out of it and are tired of Wall Street. And the antagonism towards Wall Street has gotten much worse because at least in the United States, a lot of the funding went into the corporations and not to directly to the very poor, as it did here, for example. Uh, we'll take two more questions. Thanks. Uh, yes, so uh, there's a follow-up question to the, to the China one. Um, there is a point where so public value perspective is if the public values this, then you should execute it. So now it's not so much the science, but the ideology behind it, because the cases and fatalities of COVID have been so low in China, it has become a point of pride and a marker that we are just that much better than the United States. And if it's something the public values, then you're addressing it. And so you say hard lockdowns, restraint, and you score points with the public because we just have to make this point. But if the people don't really believe that, then you're doing something against their values. That's the public value perspective. But ideology and science, again, chapter three, they don't necessarily go hand in hand from a public value perspective. Take uh, two more questions. Oh, sir, go ahead.
Um, to, to summarize the question, to what extent do you feel traditions and social relations as they have existed impacted uh, outcomes uh, in the pandemic, as in close friendships, families, inequalities among the public? Do you feel that these sorts of long-standing issues were big in determining how countries succeeded in the pandemic? I can offer my answer, in, and that is that uh, naturally the case study shows that uh, the social relations, civil society has a huge part in this. It can fill the gap where the state may not be able to do so. And if you're a disciplined society, it means that when the state says this is how it is, then we can actually conform to that. Otherwise, you are the one resisting that, which means that if these are your values, to conform to those values, the government has to then do that instead, which may not be based on a scientific reasoning and that can be very damaging so if the public wants this if you want to adhere to that you better do that but that may not be the best because the public doesn't decide in its favor what it wants based on the science that's where social relations and traditions can make a big difference uh, in the interest of time i don't think we should take more questions we're running a little bit over time i'll hand it over to the moderator Thank you, sir. I would now like to invite President Cass to deliver his closing remarks. So, ladies and gentlemen, I always have a problem at the end of every seminar. Since I'm always the last speaker, I'm always here to repeat things. So, I try and this time uh, try, bear with me some parameters that I won't repeat. Uh, I like to avoid as much as I can cut down in my speech. But there's two essentials that are to be understood uh, that Dr. Usman pointed out. First of all, let me thank Reading Reference for sparing your valuable time for today's event for launching uh, a very important book by Dr. Usman, Pandemics and Public Value Management. My special thanks to Professor Anna from uh, USA from St. Uh, Louis University, uh, Professor uh, Bracci, University of Ferrara, Italy, and Professor Carl Moore from Magdalene University, Canada, for being with us uh, to offer their valuable views on the book authored by our colleague and a public value theorist, Dr. Osman Jahan, who's our Director of Economic Affairs at CAS. Uh, this is his fourth book. And uh, he, he said this speech, the best one, I like to differ with him, best one so far. You have the ability to do much more and much better performance. The pandemic under discussion, the COVID-19, set the word hastily and mercifully. In the wake, it left hardships and misery for the world at a level unseen, at least in our lifetime. 
in response to its swiftness and severity, societies came close to themselves going off, shutting down completely, thus creating economic disruption and aftershocks for the entire world. The pandemic has actually shaken the entire health, economic, and logistic systems of the globe. While it seems receding, its effects still continue, some of which are also visible on the streets of Pakistan in the form of economic turmoil. Economic fragility, underfunded public sector providers, political figures, and social inequality all made themselves evident as societies were put under immense duress. There were intense manifestations of challenges to the values held by the public, as well as questions raised on what each public truly values. The book, as Dr. Swan mentioned, has seven chapters, and I just touched on some important aspects of chapter two and chapter six in the back of the two parts. Chapter two talks of lives and livelihoods. It is probably not a competition, but a prioritization between the two by various tools of the society. And there are three tools that he's talked about. I, I'm sorry if I'm using the wrong terminology. The political leadership, they shape the direction. Societies absorb it and react to the direction. So the, these are the important elements. And then the people are the two, that is to do, that is the bureaucrats, deputy commissioners, mayors, and all that, those who implement the instructions. So it's not only the leadership. Yes, that makes the difference, but the people below who do it matter a lot. Now that is what I will talk of uh, India, Pakistan, comparison to some extent, or have we figured out well. And, but first, the comparison of the two pandemics, 1918 to 20, the flu, and uh, uh, COVID-19. In, uh, uh, in, uh, in the chapter, mentions about the 43 countries data. 39 million people died in 1918 to 22 years. That's 2% of the population of that time in the world. That is huge. However, if the same ratio was to go, the COVID-19 also has more or less the same uh, time frame. But the, uh, if, if same ratio was to continue or, or to follow, the depth should have been about 150 million. Imagine if there were 150 million deaths. So, so the two flows, what he, what he wants to mention, both have been handled probably differently, both in terms of livelihood and lives. Uh, so there is no data as yet completed on COVID, but on the previous pandemic, six to eight percent of the GDP in was lost on the average world. It's also not a smaller figure. Uh, COVID-19, many countries have gone to that. Some have even gone below. So this also talks of uh, the countries that successfully, Dr. Swan says, successfully played a balance between lives and livelihood have done better than the other. I, uh, for, for my own reasons, uh, I would like to retouch uh, the India Pakistan comparison. The reason is, uh, I feel that had these figures been made available at that time to our society, 
through the media because our media is used to keeping up the negative effects the negative impacts uh, of negative uh, part of, of of an event to make a breaking news the positivity was left out there are a lot of positives in pakistan and in the world had we known this as a society we may have been done even better than this we only knew the negative side of it mostly uh a multi actor triangle approach to pakistan's coronavirus effects uh, as per dr sman's research uh, comparing the two india and pakistan first the political leadership in case of pakistan he mentioned it, sober appraisal coordinated stats in case of india it was a brutal lockdown corruption and so many other things that you mentioned uh, if you look at these two we stand out far better in our reaction to this as the doctor on research is concerned it's, it's all based on research not of opinion alone the second was the civil society of course there was a question also uh, uh, asked two questions of this the charitable disposition and efforts to mutual aid rural support programs these played major role in us reduce deaths and 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 keeping the balance if if you recall in our society also probably leadership played a major role because when we saw in the beginning like the whole world Uh, our people were also at different tiers of political level, going against the government, go for a lockdown. When everybody else is going for a lockdown, why don't you go for a lockdown? The taking this pressure was a big plus factor for the society, and I think the, the leadership needs uh, a commendable uh, appreciation on that. The third was the public managers. Whatever the reasons, uh, in Pakistan. it was centralized coordination of civil military manpower mobilization it was center point and 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 it was effective the enforcement decisions of the the center of operations were effective now while at that time we were always hearing from the media that you know we are not doing this we are not doing this we are not doing this but actually it was a balance being played how much to lose bear or how much to gain bear that was the balance being played by our manager our society so and in 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 india of uh, swan mentions it has in act through the process and total mismanagement and lack of coordination if you recall uh, i just to explain the same point that dr kumar mentioned one day uh, mr modi decides to declare a lockdown of everything in delhi now delhi is a big city people come across from long distances to earn their daily living and people had to walk hundreds of miles to save to, to go to safer places to go to their homes and of course people lost their lives in between got injuries they had to stay in jungles it is it's a terrible thing to uh, see that so that, that that's the difference i so what happened that's the result that in uh, the five other elements that you mentioned where we achieved a uh, five mark out of five rating in case of pakistan and zero was over out of five in india is is it's not a small achievement i think our society our managers our leadership deserves that credit for this achievement uh there are various factors i like to not like to repeat those i just move on to some of the conclusions that i have read of course out of the book that uh, i had to read before i go on the scene making in our society must reflect the values of the people and should intend to serve the people 
during the pandemic preserving lives and livelihood public health and economy were equally important the countries that succeeded in the pandemic like i said earlier were the ones that up, upheld a commitment to both covid 19 was a test of all countries and pakistan's remarkable performance during this difficult period despite meager resources shows that we were capable of confronting even great challenges shows that protecting the people was as important like as their life international institutions are now struggling to find their place in changing world order also touched by dr usman this is a very important point uh the international leaders means the who was not given its due lead the nations leaders national leadership prioritize their priorities of how to handle it that probably also resulted in what dr khan said the vaccine nationalism because the leaders thought of their national interest not of the humanity if if it was world health organization handling these subjects the result may have been better in case of pandemic it is not just the covid pandemic that has been difficult for the world economy but the post covid problems including supply issues and global inflation are equally worrying at this stage uneven recoveries around the world are putting developing countries at extreme economic risk as we have come on to the effects will last for a little while it's not over as yet health is a basic human right which is why the market based approaches tend to cause problems so look i have the money i can buy it the others have no money they have no right the, the disparity was so much certain countries had gone to the booster stage where the countries did not even have the first dose they did not have the money this disparity as uh, dr sab terms it the vaccine nationalism took uh, all of lot of things in poor countries and the developed covid 19 possibly is not going to be the last pandemic mankind has seen therefore there was a need to put in place a well functioning international system that can help make us more resilient during future crises the world needs to be ready for such pandemics including the poor part Ladies and gentlemen, at the end, once again, uh, let me thank you on behalf of CAS for uh, the uh, two, of course, our uh, honourable uh, speakers for their views, and uh, for the guests to spare time, and the CAS team for making this arrangement. Uh, and I thank you all. Thank you, sir. This brings us to the conclusion of the ceremony. Lastly, it remains for me to pay my sincere gratitude to the distinguished speakers and the esteemed audience for joining us today at this book launch event and making it a success. I now request you all to proceed with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Enrico, Carl, for sparing your time. We're all headed off to tea right now. If I could, I would offer you a virtual tea myself. But well, we have tea here in Canada. <laughs> yeah, as well. In, in Italy, two of those. Uh, yeah.
It's very so hot have nowadays. have a nice tea and think of me. <laughs> Thank you, Osman, for invitation. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, enjoyable conversation. Thank you. Take care. See you again. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.